Good morning, church family. Good morning. You brought your smiling faces and your singing voices, yes? Page 196. Tell me the old, old story. For 
the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see some visitors here. Welcome to them. Welcome to all the members. We just be glad to be here today in the house of the Lord to worship Him. It's been a beautiful week. A little bit hot. A little bit of sunburn. But it's nice. And for announcements, we have Leonard bring the first announcement. Last week, we had the first reading for the uh, nominating committee's uh, selection for our upcoming officers. That was our first reading. And today, we're going to have the second reading. I was wondering, are there any out there who was not here last Sabbath, church members that need one of these? If you do, raise your hand. I'll see you get one. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll bring it to you in a minute, Rob. Okay. That being said then, uh, I'm not going to read every name like I did last Sabbath. I would entertain a motion, though, that we accept the recommendations of the nominating committee. So I'm looking for a motion and a second. Any? I make a motion. Okay, got a, got a first motion that we have a second. Second motion, okay. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, I appreciate that. Looks like the motion is carried, so we look forward to having our new members take office, I believe, in July. First of July. First of July. Lord bless you. Thank you. I believe Emily has a, an announcement. I have a few things I want to mention, so I'll try to be quick. One is, I think it was announced last week, or at least it's in the announcements in the bulletin, but we are doing our camp out this year, same place, same time. It's at the Diamond Lake um, uh, campground. Let's see, what's the campground? <laughs> it's at Diamond Lake, but it's the side campground. And we have a sign-up sheet on the back because we do really need to know how many RVs are coming since the spaces are limited in the group site, we may have to uh, reserve some other private sites if we need more. So please sign up as soon as possible because those sites get taken very quickly, so we would wanna know. And um, another announcement is our um, directory that we handed out last week. We uh, are gonna make, need to make some revisions to it. Apparently there's some of the information that's wrong <laughs> in it. Um, so if you do not, we, 
if you do not um, have your phone number correct in the in the directory, please let Valerie or myself know, or let Lisa know. She can put it in the direct in the bulletin, I guess. But um, Krista told me that she does have a lot of the pictures ready, so we can redo it with pictures. If you have not submitted a picture or had her taken your picture to Krista, um, she's got little uh, information papers on the greeter's desk back there where, the, um, where you sign for a guest book. Pick it up and then you'll have the information of where to send your picture to so that we can put them in the directory. So that's an update on that. And then the uh, announcement is next Sabbath, I know it's in the bulletin, but I wanna make sure you see it. We are having a reception at the fellowship dinner for Dwayne and Carol. And so we want to make sure that you know about that and that you come prepared. We will have a card for everyone to sign, so you'll sign ahead of time. Uh, Jeannie will have that when she's here next week. We'll have a nice special cake for them, and we want to give them our well wishes. So next Sabbath at the Fellowship Meal will be a recognition of Dwayne and Carol's uh, recent marriage. Um, I think that was all um, that I had. Thank you. You have something, Jack? Some of you probably remember that um, two months ago on March 19th, we had a health seminar there in Glendale where we had some cooking demonstrations and some presentations. I did one and, and uh, there were uh, several cooking demonstrations. Well, tomorrow, the 21st of May, we're going to have another one. Um, I don't remember her last name, but her first name is Ingeborg. And she's, some of you probably know her. She's been around this area for a long time. We call her Inga. Uh, she's going to be doing some cooking demonstrations with others, and there will be uh, a presentation on the difference between plant proteins and animal proteins by a nutritionist. And so if you are available, we would love to have you come. It's at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon at the depot in Glendale, and uh, we're going to have some tasting and some fun time, so we hope you can join us if you have the time. Thank you. We have a request for transfer. We have the first reading for Lucy Williams to transfer from North Valley to Canyonville. That's the first reading. We'll have a second reading next week. Hey everybody, remember these flyers that are in your bulletin talking about Dennis Preby? Especially, we want to keep that in your minds. Please come, he's a good speaker. Any more announcements? Okay, it's time for our prayer and praise requests. And the deacons will bring uh, microphones around. have a, um, a praise report. I'm going to be a new grandma again. There will be six grandchildren. And um, yesterday my last car broke down, so I have the church family keep me in their prayers for the market for a new car. Continue to pray for Vern. He's going in for surgery on Monday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. We have to be there in Medford. And we solicit your prayers, and we appreciate so much the prayers that we really have depended on here at the church. And God is blessing. Amen. But he's not out of the woods yet, so continue to pray. Thank you so much. Yeah. Pray for 
pray for pray for Jeannie because she's coming home tomorrow and she'll be traveling. Be good to have her back. I'd like to uh, praise. My son's still cancer free so far. Keep praying. Um, his five year old finished kindergarten, graduated. She'll be six in June. She lost her first, first tooth. And uh, um, as for my daughter, has three little girls, eight, six, and four, and I'll leaving Wednesday morning to go fly out to see those three grandchildren. They're all girls, so it should be fun. Anyone else up front here? I'm sure most of you have noticed Harry's not here today. He got some kind of flu bug, so keep him in your prayers. And that I don't get it. Hmm. Okay, I have also prayer requests for one uh, Hispanic guy. I, know, I don't know his name. I just uh, bumped into him in a uh, lumber store. So I gave him National Sunday Law in Spanish. And I encourage every member of our church, you know, to get some Spanish literature for these people. And make a goal. Every week you pass one piece of literature to somebody. That should be our goal, you know, so it will spread quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I want to thank the Lord that my son came down from Vancouver, Washington this week, stayed the whole week, and uh, we enjoyed that. And then today, we were sitting there this morning, and he got to asking questions about the Adventist faith. And so, who knows? Pray for him, pray for my wife and my daughter. <clears throat> when Emil mentioned literature, I just... I jogged my memory. Um, Dick Hoy is going to be our speaker next Sabbath, and he'll be here also in the afternoon giving us a, a, some updates from AWR, which sound fascinating. A couple of things about that. We are still short in our goal for our God Pods. We did really fast. We, we got our amount the first time. This last time it's been a little slower, so I think it'd be great if we used next Sabbath as a real push to finish that $900 we need for our God Pods. And he offered, he can bring us 10 cases of great controversies for free if we want them. So I said, yeah, yes, bring, so bring them. Um, I told him, I'm not sure if we can store 10 cases, but he'll be bringing several cases of uh, great controversies for us to have for free. And he says he can get a lot more for free. He's getting them from Remnant pub Publications. And um, he's a representative of AWR, so he can distribute those for to churches who are willing to hand them out and our church is praise the lord well, if that's all let's <clears throat> go to our scripture reading today i'll be reading out of psalms chapter 113 verses 1 to 4 <clears throat> Psalms 113, 1 to 4. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. And sunset, sunrise to sunset is not just on Sabbath. His names be praised every day of the week. <clears throat> Those that are able, please kneel for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just thank you for this time we can come to your house to worship you. We just thank you for being with us and keeping us in your care all week. We thank you.
for being with us today. Be with those that couldn't make it. Keep them in your care. Help them to have a blessed Sabbath wherever they're at. We pray for all the requests that were made today, prayer requests and praises. We just ask you to work in each person's heart, mind, and body. Guide and bless us as we go through this service. We pray that Dan will bring your word to us and not his own. Guide his tongue and guide our hearts that we might be receptive to your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. But he's cordially invited. We invite you to stand for the opening hymn, page 327. Be the king of a vast domain. 
Thank you. You may be seated. It's now time for tithes and offerings. Today's loose offering is for the local church budget. We need to remember our local church budget. It takes care of all the house here, keeps the heat, air conditioning, things like that going, lights, water, just keeps upkeep on this property that we have, that the Lord has given us to use. Remember, this is the Lord's house, so we want to keep it up. Let's please write. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we can return a portion of what you've given us. We just thank you for the gifts and the giver. Be with us now through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now time for our scripture reading, reading from Mark 12, 13 through 17. Mark 12, 13 through 17. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered, saying unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. The Lord had his blessing to the reading of his word. Now I'll turn the time over for Dan to bring the Lord's word to us today. It's a privilege to be here with you today. I've been down to your church a few times, but not to, not to share a sermon. So Rob extended an invitation, and I said I'd be pleased to come and share with you today. Just by way of history, some of, well, really, much of what we're going to share today 
Um, as I was inquiring about, uh, in my own life, asking some questions about the times in which we have been going through the last three or four years, I'm not sure I was looking for anything necessarily deeper. I was just looking for the real crux of the issue. And really what we're going to share today, I, I believe, is that crux, that major uh, central point, that as Christians and as Seventh-day Adventists, will be vital for us to know and understand and have a working experience for the times in which we're heading. So, if you don't mind, let's bow our heads just for a word of prayer and ask uh, God again to just guide us as we share this time together. Father in heaven, we are so truly grateful that we can gather on this Sabbath morning. And as we do so, and as we open your word, as we consider the words of inspiration that you have given to guide us, as we consider the lessons uh, that we have seen in our uh, distant uh, history and in our current history, that we would better understand your your will and your ways that we might represent you with all our hearts. And we're thankful, Lord, for your spirit to lead and guide us. And we welcome you here in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My wife would have loved to be here today, but she, we kind of had to do a divide and conquer day to pull some, some conflicting issues that came up in the family and uh, church responsibilities el elsewhere, and so uh, uh, maybe another another time. <clears throat> You'll see here the title of our sermon today is The Grand Prize, <clears throat> and it's um, by design that I listed it The Grand Prize. If some of you have heard this before, my apologies, but... Uh, uh, I've given it a couple of times, and my mind has been stimulated with different things, and maybe yours will be too. <clears throat> but the grand prize in the great controversy is something that um, I think will help us in our, our daily walk and our daily experience, and um, so I share it with, with that intent. And you'll see the subtitle there, The Grand Prize in the Great Controversy. Because there is a controversy that's going on, um, and you all are aware of that, how we fit into that is maybe not so clear to us at times. <clears throat> to begin with, I want to share just a story. There was a, a, a British general from the Revolutionary War here who was questioned about what he feared most. What was it that had caught his attention, that he feared the very most in the recent war that he had just been through here in the States? And the inquirer listed a, a bunch of things that he may have or could have been fearful of, the general just kind of shook his head, no, 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 not those things. Well, the guy says, well, then what, what, what was it that you, that you feared the most? And the general answered, and I hope this is on and working. Oop, I got to do this. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's, uh, it's in the on position. There we go. And what he feared the most was the Minutemen. I say, well, why in the world would you fear the Minutemen, the Minutemen the most? A bunch of ragtag soldiers that just, you know, come out of nowhere and go into nowhere. And, and he said, well, they were certainly a ragtag group. But the reality is, 
is that these Minutemen had convictions that if you wanted to silence them, you had to kill them. And when I read that illustration, I thought, hmm, I wonder if my convictions will, will hold me through some of the challenging times that we have yet in front of us. Oh, I'm like you. I haven't appreciated the last few years too much in terms of societal uh, issues and, and all. <clears throat> but you know as well as I do, we ain't seen nothing yet. And part of this is here in this statement. I hope this didn't go too far. It might have. Part of it goes here in this statement. Throughout our history, Satan has sought every occasion to take control of the minds of mankind. And today he is seeking to bind the minds of God's servant that they may not be able to discern the precious principles of truth. Now this may just seem irrelevant to you, but I want you to notice this how do I get this to work? Eh, it doesn't show. I want you to notice there the control of the mind. Here it is that Satan has been involved <coughs> in controlling the hearts and minds of mankind. And while I don't want to focus on it, <coughs> I don't want to dwell on it forever, I think it's valuable for us to realize that this is his plan. This is his, uh, his efforts. In a book that was written by uh, a guy named David Gibbs, uh, and you can see O-N-U-G, One Nation Under God, an interesting little book on religious liberty. David Gibbs has been an attorney um, professionally for years, and his primary focus has been that of defending religious liberty. I don't believe he's of our faith, but that has been his, his devotion and calling. And he makes this comment, he says, <clears throat> our founding fathers all knew that because man is sinful, power should not be vested in any one person. Echoing scripture, even though Benjamin Franklin really didn't totally believe in himself, Benjamin declared, <clears throat> there is scarce a king in a hundred that would not, if he could, follow the example of Pharaoh. Get all of the people's money, all of the lands, and then make them and their children slaves forever. There we go. I need to press it a little bit more diligently. <clears throat> From our scripture reading, we read today that Jesus recognized the trap that was, being, that was being set for him. He knew of the hypocrisy of the leaders and their efforts to, as it were, not only control and, and, and manipulate his mind, but that which was being perpetrated on the people to control and manipulate um, uh, their minds. And, and so, as we come down through the time, the, the, the scheme of time, you can go to Revelation 12 and 13. We'll not read all that. We're going to read here in Revelation 13 in just a minute. But Revelation 12 and 13 have quite a review of the picture of the great controversy, why it's there, why it exists. And if, if we'll see, we can see ourselves in, uh, in play in these things. And, and God is giving us insights through John to, um, uh, to help us, as it were, to be ready. 
in these sections, there's also quite a review of the kingdoms uh, of uh, this world's um, uh, uh, history here that have uh, led, uh, been endeavoring to do much the same thing. And in Daniel chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there, Daniel chapter 3, <clears throat> there is some very poignant comments in regards to um, this grand prize issue that we're talking about. As the story begins there in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar has set up a, a, an image. I never thought of it necessarily before, but you know, to build something that's uh, as tall as this image was, you know, this wouldn't have been some miraculous thing that just kind of poof popped up overnight, right? It would have been something that would have been taking a, a considerable amount of time and effort and, and would have, like road construction, how do you get by it without seeing it, you know? And so here it is, people would have seen and recognized some of these things. And I can't imagine if you and I were there, we wouldn't have had uh, the inquisitive mind that says, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what this is all about anyway. Well, they found out quickly what it was all about. The king had forgotten Daniel's talk with him from chapter 2 and was intent on making himself uh, a name and uh, insisted that people bow down and worship him. And we'll pick it up here in verse 16 with our three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzars, we are, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Not careful? You, we read that and we think, oh, you know, they're just being rude. No. These were men of conviction that, that said, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not careful. We're not, gonna, we're not going to uh, uh, go out of the way to... Uh, to uh, bow down to what you're doing. We have already thought this through in our minds. We're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hands, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that... <clears throat> We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So if these three young men had been walking by for days or weeks or months or whatever the time was, they were thinking, they were reasoning, they were wondering, what is going on here? Well, they found out quickly on this particular day what the king's intent really was. But because of their walk with God, they were prepared for the issue. And I think it behooves us to consider, are we prepared in our walk with God to meet these issues? Are we seeing the image or the images of the day being built up that would uh, conflict with our conscientious convictions and our conscience? Are we, are, are, are we, are we endeavoring to, to make things right with us and God so that say, Lord, lead and guide me, help me through this? If this sort of a crisis came on you and I, and I'll diverge only this far, we've seen that in the last few years preparatory to where we're headed. The conscience issues control. And can we answer, oh no, we're not careful in these things. We have already, God and I has already talked this out. And we know what we will do. I'm hoping... I can get this right here sometime. 
This is in the Desire of Ages. It says, <clears throat> when we learn the power of His Word. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have read the Word of God? It's kind of like a no-brainer, right, <clears throat> in a church. But at the same time, do we know the power of God? See, there may be a difference there. The power of God working in my life, the power of His Word working in my life, it, it might be easy to miss that particular point. But when we learn the power of His Word, we shall not follow the suggestions of Satan in order to obtain food or to save our lives, our only question will be, what is God's command? And what are His promises? The last great conflict, in the last great conflict, those who are loyal to God will see what? You've read this. Every earthly support Cut off. Now step back just a, a, a page or so here. You're Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel's friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How much earthly support was there for these boys? See, th th this isn't anything new that we're, we're reading about here. <clears throat> this is just a continuation of history that here we are, every earthly support will be cut off. Cut off, why? Because of our conscientious convictions to follow the will and the ways of, of God. As we look in Daniel chapter 2, <clears throat> it discusses there, as you know, the uh, kingdoms up to our day. And the longest ruling kingdom of all this is one that you hear a lot about. It's the longest ruling kingdom. It's a powerhouse of wealth, influential uh, religious political system, and the smallest recognized kingdom on earth with only 109 acres. And, and we could go off into all of that realm. But I guess the bigger issue to me is this. What was or what is this kingdom, uh, kingdom's objective? What's their hope? What's their design? As we look at, as we look at history, we can see <clears throat> that the church and the state, and this is, this is a challenge. It's not flipped the wrong way. The church... And the state is the sequence. The church and the state has declared during the time of Martin Luther, he declared him an outlaw and it was forbidden to teach or believe in his doctrines. Now you know as well as I do, Martin Luther didn't have everything right. But what God had revealed to him, okay, what God was showing, what God was awakening in society, was monumental, and we still refer to it. Well, it was during some of this time that they had a diet in Spears in 1526, and they decided, okay, well, we'll give you religious liberty. Temporarily, <laughs> okay, temporarily. So three years later, in 29, you can see, Charles V, <clears throat> uh, he was bent on destroying the Reformation. He thought, well, how do I do this? Well, 1529, he called another diet and announced to the, uh, that, that, the, that, that the granting of liberty of conscience, the granting of what? Liberty of conscience. Okay, this is, and it, this is important for us to see. The granting of her liberty, uh, liberty of conscience had given rise to great disorder? I mean... I, as I read it, it just, it just kind of boggles my mind. Disorder? Are you kidding me? But that's, that's how, he, that was his view on things. <clears throat> and was to be declared invalid. But we can, 
we can praise the Lord for a group of men that at this particular time uh, stood up, and it was the German princes. I'm in half German, half English, so I don't know if I've got any heredity things, but you know, it's not connected with DNA anyway, but I, I think of these German princes. And so they stood up, and in 1929, they are really what formed, uh, Ellen White tells us in Great Conover, they formed the very essence of Protestantism. Now, dwell on that just a little bit. Formed the very essence of Protestantism. And the principle that, they, that inspired the Protestant reform was the presumed right of Rome to coerce conscience and forbid free inquiry. Free inquiry of what? The scriptures. And that was that was their that was their big play. Remember, chain it to the chain it to the wall. You know, we're the ones that'll interpret it for you. Okay, whereas the Reformation gave us the Bible. Okay, <clears throat> the princes determined that in matters of conscience, the majority has no power. The principle that we should remember here: the basis. And, ref and, and foundation of the German prince's decision and convictions rested on the word of God as they opposed two abuses. Now look at these two abuses. Some of you, I know you've read these things. I'm sorry to just review a bunch of old hat, but as we put it together in the days in which we're living, I think it has increased value and meaning for us. So these were the two abuses that the German, German princes opposed. One was the intrusion of civil magistrates. And we don't need to think too much farther than that in terms of societal issues today, okay? Remember how Ellen White tells us, I don't remember where it is right now, where she says, there'll come a time when every principle of the Constitution will be repudiated, done away with, canceled, denied, not followed, The intrusion of the civil magistrates. The second was the arbitrary authority of the church. Arbitrary authority of the church. But true Protestantism, and I want to say that while Protestantism has taken a big hit, it is not dead. If in the hearts and minds of God's people, we will keep these things alive for His glory. True Protestantism sets the power of the conscience above the magistrate and the authority of the Word of God above the visible church. Sets the order, sets the stage, sets the importance of this. Protestantism rejects the civil power in divine Things and says with the prophets and apostles, we must do what? Obey God rather than man. And it goes even further. It lays down the principle that all human teaching should be subordinate to the word of God. Subordinate in the sense of the meaning of it's lower in rank and power. The word of God is above Everything. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth, Emily. It's above everything. And when we don't see it that way, we fall into the dilemma that exists in society today. Well, you know, who, else should, who should I listen to? Who should I go by? What should I, what should I do? But God has given us his word to help us know that his power is above all powers and subordinate to none. That's the true protestant view that you and I can, can hold to. As we contrast some of the character between God and Satan, this reference here from great controversy, God never forces the will or the conscience. 
And we can dwell on that just a little bit. What a God that we serve. How much He loves and cares for us. <clears throat> that He wants to come and reason together with us. He wants to help us see and understand and follow it because we love Him. Not because of fear or force or So God never forces the will or the conscience, but <laughs> Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and civil, church and state issues, okay? We have to keep that, we have to keep that, 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 that process in mind, <clears throat> or secular authorities, it says, moving them to enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. And this is, this is really fundamental to what it is that you and I are experiencing in the world about us today. I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm not a, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, just criticizing what's, what's going on. I, <clears throat> this, this all came to me in my understanding, and I'm just relaying it back to you for whatever value it may be to you, but these things we will face as in Daniel uh, chapter uh, 3, the three Hebrews faced the civil authorities. And Peter and Paul in Acts chapter 4 there, they faced the religious authorities of their day. Okay? And the, the repeated union of these uh, these two uh, authorities throughout history has continued uh, to oppress God's people. I uh, was just talking to some friends that came up to visit uh, late yesterday afternoon to get some raspberry starts. And uh, um, they, stayed, they stayed quite a bit longer than I thought they would. But there was two things that we got to talking about that you're never supposed to, never, don't ever talk about these. Politics and religion. Don't ever talk about those. But we talked about them. Because this, this young couple understands something is afoot in society today. They can't totally make sense out of it because without the insights of God's Word, it winds up being a little bit muddled, and you can just follow some theory that's out there. But here it is, this union between these, uh, these two authorities uh, is really the battlefield or the grand prize. And the question is, will our conscience remain free by following the teachings of God's Word, or will we be deceived, compelled, controlled, frightened into compliance for the greater good. If you've heard those words, the greater good, those are not just idle buzzwords. Okay? Those are intentional. They are purposeful. They are in, intended to, to uh, put at rest any conscientious conviction that you had and just go along with society because you want the best for everybody. And you know I'm being facetious about that. Thank you, brother. <laughs> so the greater good is something that uh, you and I uh, do need to keep in view, but it has to be in a proper context. And I want you to turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We'll read just a couple of uh, verses here. 
you, you undoubtedly have read and seen some of this before, but there's a portion that I want uh, to, to highlight just a little bit for us. We'll start there in verse 11 and read through just verse, uh, verse uh, 15. In verse 11 it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth this time, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Quite a description, wouldn't you say? And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, in, in, in part of this then, the, the wound that was healed is really part of what this earth beast's role is all about. Healing the deadly wound. And he doth great wonders, that is, that is the earth beast. He does great wonders so that he made fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. An effort, an illusion, as it were, to um, uh, authenticate, it, as it were, his power. Okay? You can go back into uh, 1 Kings and see some of that uh, with uh, uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel. An exercise of, it was, it was to represent God's power. This, at this point it's been flipped, uh, but still a representation of power and authority. In verse 14, and he deceived uh, them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had a wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. <clears throat> Here it is, we've got, in this section of scriptures, we've got primarily three or four, or four uh, players here. The lamb-like beast, <clears throat> the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and the name and number of the beast. For our purposes today, or we'd be here a whole lot longer than Rob's given me permission to stay here, uh, we're just going to concentrate on these top two, the lamb-like beast and the image uh, of the beast. See, the lamb-like beast, <clears throat> thirst for power, is really a copycat of history. He's just wanted power and authority. It's, the, it's an expression, really, of what Satan's all about and what he has desired, what he has wanted throughout history. He's just had the agencies of history working on his behalf. <clears throat> Miracles to authenticate the deception, threats uh, to personal security, and a revival of despotic or overpowering authority will be used to manipulate and overpower the conscience. <laughs> you see, and this is what I believe the, you, you, you've, you've read, and we'll read here in just a minute, the issues of what the image to the beast is all about. The church and the state working together to enforce their dogmas and blah, blah, we'll read about this. But what does it mean to me personally? What, what is this saying to me in a personal sense here? Well, it strikes me that uh, this this image power will ultimately um, be demonstrated by the uniformity of worship. Okay? But how you get to this is the work of the image in the process of, of society and the, uh, the insights that prophecy is giving to us here. From great controversy again, we read the image um, represents a likeness or resemblance of history. Okay, what was the image on the plain of Dura? It was a likeness of the king. Okay, 
the power, the authority of that particular day. So when the leading churches, it's the leading churches we're talking about here of the United States, unite upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy, a likeness, a resemblance of the Roman hierarchy. And the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters, that is the minority view, okay? And you know we're not living in a time when minority view means anything. You know, your, your view if you're in a minority is worthless in essence because you're not working for the greater good of society, okay? So your conscientious convictions will be seen as little or no value at all. Um, the significance of this is here in the quote from uh, Seven Bible Commentary. The image to the beast will be formed before the close of probation. And notice these words, it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destinies will be decided. And this comment just gripped me when you realize that, yes, it is, what, it is what's being talked about here with the union of church and state and how they're bringing about their powers and all that sort of thing. But what's the, what's the bottom line issue for me? Will it control my, will these things so control my conscience that I can't be true to my conscience? See, that strikes me as really the, the grassroots of, of all of, of these things. Not that I don't disagree with this. I don't want you to think that. I don't disagree with this in any particular. But the grassroots of this comment are uh, that which will be the great test. Will the image control my conscience, or will it not? It will try, <laughs> okay? It, and it certainly, it certainly will, be, will be seen uh, in that respect. Revelation 13 tells us that civil and religious authorities will again make laws to restrict religious liberty. They will assume the right that is God's alone. And if we're true to our conscience, we will follow God alone. So there's a dilemma that's created here from all of this. Okay? And it's not just about somebody else establishing laws. It's about how is that impacting me as an individual? What's happening to me in this process? Okay? Not, I'm not trying to say that self-centeredly. I'm just, you know, for us as individuals, what will this mean to us? It says... Uh, they will assume the right that is God's alone. They will think that they can force the conscience which God alone should control. So in other words, as we've kind of already mentioned here, in other words, the image is designed to control the conscience. It's not just about uh, you know, them agreeing upon their, their institutions and supporting their dogmas and whatnot. It's about controlling the conscience uh, of, of the individual. Well, how did the founders of this country view these issues? Okay? They didn't have the advantage of spirit of prophecy. <clears throat> Some of them probably hadn't had Bibles maybe all that long. I don't know. But this is what it says. It says, Congress shall make no laws regarding the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You've read these, heard these things. The framers of the Constitution recognized that the eternal principle that man's relation with God is above human legislation. And the rights of conscience inalienable. You've heard these words. We're going to look at it just a little bit. They felt that their duty to God was superior to human enactments and that man could exercise no authority over their conscience. And this is taken from great controversies, but it's just, it's just words right out of the congressional um, 
documents there. Christian exiles who first uh, fled to America and sought <clears throat> an asylum from the royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon broader, the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. That's our assumption, isn't it? Okay, that's our assumption. But if the principles of, that have, have governed life in this country as the crowning jewel, really, of society in terms of religious liberty uh, in, in history, there's going to be some problems here. Their views found place in the Declaration of Independence, which uh, sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And freedom of religious faith was also granted every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates. And you can see this. This keeps coming up over and over of his own, her own conscience. Republicanism, Protestantism, became the uh, foundational principles uh, of the nation. These, I get this, these principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. So I'd like to encourage us to examine just a couple of words here. Inalienable rights. Have you ever thought of that? I hadn't, necessarily. I know it was a word. I go, okay, good. No, inalienable rights. But I didn't really think and understand what the meaning was so much. Rights which cannot be given or taken away. That's what an inalienable right is. Can't be given away, can't be taken away. It's there. God gave it. Praise the Lord. Protestantism opposes the presumed right of Rome to coerce conscience and forbid the free inquiry of Scripture. Protestantism rejects that notion. Rejects Rome's presumed rights. Republicanism, a form of government. Notice the, notice the distinction on these next two. A form of government in which authority is given to the duly elected persons to represent the interests of its citizens. A, a charter or constitution protects the, what rights? Inalienable. Ones that can't be given away, ones that can't be taken away. The inalienable rights of an individual and minorities. A democracy, on the other hand, and, and, and some of you can think back when, 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 to, when there, was, there was little discussion about uh, a democracy, okay? But over and over and over, that concept has been promoted. And people have just succumbed to it, as it were. Oh, well, we're just a democracy. No. <clears throat> if it, <laughs> they, they still haven't changed yet the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic, okay? So the republic uh, then has a charter, has a constitution, has inalienable rights for the individuals and minorities. But a democracy, a, representation, a representative form of government similar to a republic, however, <coughs> the will and views of the majority can limit and be imposed on the minority. Now the distinction is just glaringly obvious in this, and as we, as we think and we view some of this, it gives us a little insight as to why the, the predicament that we find ourselves in in society now exists. The, the definitions have been changed. The view, the perspective, you're only allowed to look through certain lenses to understand this. And, and, but God's Word has, has given us some guidance and instruction Hallelujah. on this, for sure. <clears throat> so then, how do we conscientiously 
handle these matters of church and state? Well, <clears throat> Peter and John probably uh, are, are at least one example that we could look at. We could probably find many, but their words seem to be clear here. Peter and John answered and said to them, this was speaking to the religious leaders of their day, their day, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you're going to have to judge. For we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. In other words, these guys were eyewitnesses to the grace of God. These guys not only had seen it, but they had heard it, implying that there was an experience of God's grace in their lives that, that they couldn't do anything else. Their conscientious convictions, they couldn't go any other, any other way but then to follow God's will and God's ways. But you and I come to a time when people, if they haven't, they will. We'll bring to you Revelation 13, or excuse me, Romans 13. Well, what's it say? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, don't you know? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. For rulers are not a terror uh, for good works, but for evil. You'll see this. Not because I'm saying it, but mark my words. Uh, we're told that it will. Well, <clears throat> this is a non-Adventist source right here. You can see Zondervan Handbook. Bear with me and read, read as we read through this here. But I think you'll see why I, I put this in. Because the authorities, the authority, the authorities are given the power by God for the public good. Christians are required to submit to them taxes are to be paid, laws observed, etc. The Christian has a duty to meet all Caesar's lawful demands. Lawful demands. But submitting does not mean that every command must be obeyed. There are times, oh, and they're coming, dear friends. There are times when these commands directly conflict with the commands of God. Wow, what are we to do then? <clears throat> there is, uh, then it's right to say, sorry, no, and suffer the consequences. That's their, their definition here from this. But I want to read a couple of other things here. Worldly policies will urge an outward compliance to the laws of the land for the sake of peace and safety, for the greater good, don't you know? <clears throat> and these, uh, and there are some who will even urge such a course <clears throat> from the scripture, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there are no powers but ordained of God. We are to receive God's word as supreme authority. We've already looked at this, but here's the context. <clears throat> receive God's word as supreme authority. We are to recognize human government. Notice these, these words are well written, well chosen. Okay. <clears throat> we are to receive God's word as supreme authority. We are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment. Wow, so where does that leave us? Let's keep reading. And teach observance to it as a sacred duty within its legitimate sphere. You, you and I are not of the persuasion of some of the radical movements that are out there in society today. Being a Christian, being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is not a radical thing. 
it will be perpetrated upon you that you are just some kind of a wacko, uh, offshoot, radical, fanatic, religious nut that's, that's and, and you won't even follow what the scriptures say. So you're going to have to, as we're told, realize what are the issues here at stake and who we will follow within their legitimate sphere. I'm not sure if this is still working. There we go. Again from this uh, attorney, uh, One Nation Under God, Early, some of the early American uh, documents referred to God as the great governor of the world. Even Benjamin Franklin, who was really a, uh, uh, not very religious and a deist, declared, it's God that governs in the affairs of man. He, people, they, founders recognized this principle. And you and I can recognize it, not because they did, but with great confidence, because that's how it's been established. <clears throat> Daniel declared, God who removes kings and sets up kings. God, Daniel knew this. this. This is nothing new under the sun. And the princes believed, and history shows, that to protect liberty of conscience is the duty of the state. And this is the limit of its authority in matters of religion. Now, you can read these, and these can just be words, as it were. But there's some fundamental principles, some fundamental values, some fundamental conscientious issues that need to go deep into our souls for the times in which um, we, we will be living, we'll be living here. But this, this attorney, uh, David Gibbs, you, you, can, you can find this book online for three bucks. It's 100, 150 pages. It's worth reading from the perspective. It gives a perspective about religious liberty issues um, uh, that are, are, are valuable for uh, your consideration if you're interested at all. Um, anyway, even in free America, it's only, it only takes five of the nine Supreme Court justices a simple majority to change the Constitution. The Constitution, David Gibbs says, is whatever the judges say it is, in contrast to God's Word, never changing. And he brings out in this book and shows how it is that uh, some of you may know this, I'm not... Uh, History hasn't intrigued me until just the last few years, but as, as I pay more attention to it, it's rather, rather than names and dates and places, there's concepts, there's principles, there's issues that have either been promoted or violated, and you and I have the opportunity and the right to consider those things and, and realize the, the blessing uh, that they are. But David, David Gibbs brings out in his book, he says, the, the government was established uh, on the uh, executive, legislative, and the judicial. <coughs> Agreed? In that order. What's happened concurrently in society is those things have been turned on their head. And the judicial branch, rather than seeing whether the laws are lawful, is now in the process of making law. And it's done with just a simple majority vote. So can you see when Ellen White talks about how the principles of the Constitution are going to be repudiated and done away with? Here's one avenue, it strikes me, as, as this could be happened. And in the issues of conscience that we're going to be facing here in the very near future. <clears throat> Renter and uh, unto God the things that are God's is a principle that clearly de defines the limits of man's duty to civil government and his duty to God. So you and I can ask, who's the higher power? To whom then are we really to submit? Well, God, of course. <laughs> 
But why? Let's look at a couple things that we've, by way of review, that we've looked at here. Submit in matters of conscience, the majority has no power. Is that a principle that you're thinking about, that you're, active, that you're actively accepting and adopting? If not, then somebody's going to come to you and say, well, you're, you're in a, you've got a minority view. It doesn't mean anything. I'll say, well, okay. You know, you just kind of mousy off into the corner and... and and we, for, we forget who it is that we're representing. We're representing the king of the universe here that is saying, that is saying to us <clears throat> uh, that in matters of conscience, I, I, I respectively disagree with your, your decision because in matters of conscience, I answer to a higher power. Protestantism sets the power of the conscience above the magistrate and authority, uh, uh, and the authority of the Word of God. Protestantism. It's in trouble, but it's not dead. Stand for Jesus. Stand for what's right. Stand for conscientious convictions that only God can help us have and, and develop and experience and demonstrate you know, what's the world waiting for? Why is Jesus tarried? People aren't, aren't ready. And when, when the, the power of God is, is experienced and seen and demonstrated in the hearts and lives of his people, and you and I have been given the privilege of sharing God's word, with the world about us, whatever that means, then Jesus will come. All human teachings should be subordinate, <coughs> excuse me, should be subordinate to the Word of God. All human. We answer to a higher power. God never forces the will or the conscience. Some simple reasons as to why you and I, oops, I think I, I whacked it too many times here. And those who exercise but little faith now, as we close here, are in the greatest danger of falling under this power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel the conscience. See, this is the work of the image. They want to compel, Satan wants to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, they will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made the habit of been made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith that's experienced today, people, that you and I can have. The lessons of faith which they have neglected. They will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. We should now acquaint ourselves with God by proving, proving His promises. Search the Scriptures. Spend much time in prayer. Seek God for grace and power to be given to us now. Proclaim the warning against disobeying the laws of a loving God. God desires His people to be prepared for the soon coming crisis. Prepared or unprepared? We must all meet it. See, the dragon really has a very, very simple plan when it comes to the image. Control the conscience. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Control the conscience at any cost. You look back through history, that's what he's been doing. Always seeking to control the conscience of mankind. And in the last great conflict and the controversy with Satan, those 
who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Every earthly support cut off. And simply for the sake of following your conscience. And except for God and His grace and His power in our life, there's not a one of us that would be overcomers. But let's remember, let's remember our three friends and how valiantly they stood for conscientious convictions. When they said, God will deliver us out of your hands, O king, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We ought to obey God rather than man. And so, it, so may it be that we would live in good conscience before God in the days in which you and I are facing. May God help us that we can see these things in a personal way and realize that God has plans that we know not of. And he wants us to understand the issues so that as we make decisions, we'll be representing him. Kind and loving and caring and cheerful representative of him. Despite what Satan would want to throw at us. May God help us to follow him in all we do. We invite you to stand for our closing hymn. Page 185. go. Sorry, your bulletin's wrong. I didn't check that. <laughs> Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine true and tender pure and precious oh how blessed to call him mine oh that thrills my soul is
of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are truly grateful that you want to be our all in all. We pray that you'll guide us, each one, that we'll understand in a meaningful and practical way day by day what that really means. May the world see Jesus in us and may it thrill our hearts and radiate out to others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.